if there is one pocket that is uh, getting touted as as a space that is doing something here and now and as, as a space that will do something throughout the current dec decade um it is uh, the the ev ecosystem if you will and there are companies which are which are traditionally into other businesses now making a significant mark in the ev space at the same time the traditional business ventures are also seeing green shoots in the industry that they are operating in one such name could arguably be greaves cotton and i think to talk about what the the journey of the company um in a space in in, in a in a sense ever since they took the pivot about a couple of years ago uh, and and what could the outlook ahead be is nagesh basavan halli he is executive vice chairman of the company he joins us right now to talk about that nagesh great having you thanks for joining in thank you thank you for having me here so the pleasure is ours so nagesh uh, tell us a bit about uh, how do you uh, in a nutshell of course uh, how different have been the last two years compared to what the previous few have been and how do you envisage what greaves currently is to what it could be over the course of the next five years wonderful thanks neeraj uh, uh, greetings to all of your viewers as well uh, i think we are in the middle of one of the deepest technology disruptions that mankind has ever seen right as uh, so uh, as part of that about 5 years ago the board decided that at the end of the day we were uh, predominantly an auto engine supplier right which meant we had strong inroads into one fuel right at that time it was diesel and petrol technically and then into automotive and then most of our revenues and profits hence came from that industry and that vertical hence the reason for the pivot so when you look at it i think from a strategic mantra about 4 years ago we said we wanted to kind of move b2b to a b2b plus b2c also we were going to do and 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 we were going to get closer to the consumer which meant we said we will provide offerings from not just diesel engines but diesel petrol and electric so we started pivoting in that direction more importantly we said from a value chain life cycle extraction how can we be a bigger player and get closer to our consumers and get value right so i think that's kind of the was a fundamental thinking so the first part of the pivot was from auto to non auto we diversified into non auto engines right and then now we have a myriad of applications construction marine defense where we supply engines right and that actually helped us through covid when shared mobility became a big issue during the automotive uh, uh, downturn during the covid time right and then the next step was obviously the retail where we started selling multi brand spares multi brand retail multi brand uh, service right through the greaves retail greaves care chain of outlets today we have about 7000 plus retailers 600 plus including the ampere side exclusive uh, dealers uh, 15000 mechanics which kind of forms the backbone of the retail the third vertical was really the electric mobility and like you rightfully said in the last 2 to 3 years i would say precisely about 36 months the company made three different acquisitions since the last 36 months uh we saw some trends we saw the unit economics turning positive especially in the two wheeler three wheeler hence our foray first into ampere which was a two wheeler then we got into a e rickshaw company and then a uh, three wheeler company right so that has been our pivot and there again was how do we get closer to the consumer how do we give the consumer that life cycle value so that it was the ecosystem effect not just giving the vehicle but also giving spares and service and financing and all of that stuff to keep the vehicle running so that's kind of been the high level journey auto to non auto then moving into fuel agnostic but more importantly into uh, dealing with the disruption head on and moving into electric mobility both two wheeler and three wheeler and the fundamental assumption here neeraj was we have always moved people and cargo through our engines now we're moving people and cargo through our products as well right i mean that's the fundamental thesis so how different would this look 5 years out from what it is currently and maybe we choose revenues as a as a base to bring about or highlight that differential between now and 5 years out 
Yeah. So I think, uh, as you can see, the potential is enormous, right? Uh, today, we are looking at a market size where I think the industry outlook, uh, let's just take industry by industry, the two-wheeler electric market, right, is going to be somewhere between four and a half to five percent by the end of this fiscal year, I see, right? Uh, and in five years, different people have different productions, uh, expert, consultants, etc., uh, but the average consensus, in my view, is somewhere 30-35%. Let's say 35% of the two-wheeler market, uh, which is a sizable market in India, gets converted to electric, right? That's a good uh, chunk of uh, several million units, right, when you look at the numbers, right? So two-wheeler electric will get into, uh, uh, will get beyond inflection point and get mainstream. Three-wheeler, I think, will also go that way because the value economics or the unit economics are there right so when you look at our own company i think now you're going to see that to your point earlier and thanks for recognizing that the traditional engine where our core strength of engineering supply chain manufacturing comes in i think we're going to be strong we are seeing a lot of green shoots even there with a lot of uh, both domestic and international customers wanting to get engines whether it was an auto or non-auto side right so that will continue to go i don't think that's going to disappear the Fuel mix will probably change. Diesel will probably go down over a period of time. CNG is we're already beginning to see, and maybe even other forms, right? Flex fuels and others, right? Uh, and over a period of time, maybe even other forms like hydrogen and stuff like that. On the electric mobility side, the two-wheeler and three-wheeler, I see huge opportunity. The market is just getting ready to take off. Retail, where we service pairs, multi-brand retail, where we are selling multi-brand products, I think that will continue to be very strong because we're closer to the consumer. So in that sense, from a single product, single customer, single industry, now we have diversified into three strong verticals with literally uh, three parallel work streams of uh, growth engines. That's kind of what gets us excited. Yeah, no, it should. But I'm, my, 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 therefore, my question would be that if, if, the, if the middle vertical that you spoke about grows, the industry grows at circa 100% CAGR, based on the numbers and the conservative estimates. And the others are also seeing green shoots, even if they are not 100% cragger like green shoots. Uh, how does the revenue pie get charted out? And more importantly, uh, what? how do you as a company uh, chart out your own course within that? Because clearly capital allocation, uh, the quantum of funding that you would seek from different stakeholders over a period of time would also change. And, I'll get to the conversation around uh, the transactions between Abdul Latif, Jamil, and you as well. So just fill us a bit on that. Yeah. So, I mean, a good point. So let's take the industry specific, since you talked about the uh, one of the vertical, which is the electric mobility, right? So the two-wheeler and the three-wheeler market, especially the two-wheeler, if it becomes uh, uh, even at a 30-35%, uh, right, is 6-7 million units market, right? And today we are at anywhere between uh, 14 15 percent market share clear today right and uh, i think when you extrapolate that over the next couple of years right i mean and of course the focus needs to be not just an early uh, more advantage that we have how do we stay there right understanding that consumer giving the consumer what the consumer wants in terms of products and service and solutions right so i think as long as we keep doing that uh, double digit kind of market share is kind of what we aspire right in that fast growing significantly big segment that's kind of no, you, you are already there and double digit is a vast number from 10 to 99 so <laughs> what's the aspiration so, so where we are mid double digit uh, right 14 15 percent because the market will need as you know uh, the market will get competitive yeah, uh, sure. getting there right i think uh, every day like uh, every month or every quarter we have new players coming in but more importantly i think it's important to kind of uh, make sure we have the right foundational steps and that's what we are focusing on do we have the right people do we have the right manufacturing capacity we have doubled our capacity and we can talk a little bit our rani pit workforce is 70 percent women are we building in the right culture Right. Are we bringing in the right technology? And behind the technology are the areas, certain core areas that we're going to make and certain we're going to buy. Uh, so those are the foundational elements we're putting in place that should hold us in good stead over the next five years. Great. Um, one question before I get to specifics uh, yes. is this whole 
uh, conversation, right, around when the entrenched players with large distribution network finally come in when the technology stabilizes, because this market is fairly large and growing for the next 10, 15 years. Um, that will prove to be a headache for the current leaders, uh, which largely constitute uh, the new age players like yourself. Uh, what would you think about that? Because certainly you have to admit that the distribution strength that the traditional players, ice engine manufacturers have is nothing to scoff at. No, no, absolutely. I think uh, it is to be well respected. In fact, we respect uh, the competition from both the traditional automakers because they got tremendous years and years of uh, uh, technology and execution experience behind them, right? On the other hand, the new age players bring their own um, set of strengths, right? Especially in the area of software and agility, right? Uh, so where are we? Honestly, that's the sweet spot we are in. We are neither on the left nor on the right. We believe we are a 160-year-old legacy company, but at the end of the day, Ampere uh, average uh, age is in the 20s. Uh, it's a, a startup plus in that environment, and we want to preserve that culture, right? So I think we are somewhere in between. And uh, no, I think there will be uh, people from the traditional automakers who will succeed. There will be people who will be the new age players who will succeed. Our goal has been, so we respect both of them. And yes, they will, the distribution and some of the other strengths that they bring in is of significant value. What we are looking at is how do we drive our agenda? We got into this, we spotted the opportunity early. How do we continue to drive mm -hmm. what the customer wants, right? And the market is huge, right? Uh, and how do we continue to evolve this? So that's kind of where, where we are and we are going to focus on our strategy. You, you recently, not recently actually, some time back, you did a fairly decently large transaction, let's say with the Saudi Arabian firm, I believe what, $221 million and a further drawdown option. Now tell us a bit about this, now that you would have digested, I'm presuming some bit of that money, uh, what, what is that being used for? How much more on the fundraising part, do you reckon you will need considering that cash flows currently as well, I presume, would not be as strong as it, it probably would be three, four, five years down the line? Yeah. So, no, no, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, first things first, uh, I think, Neeraj, I want to highlight that uh, uh, not only are we looking at market share, we're also looking at driving the business responsibly for our mm -hmm. shares. And what that means is we've been PBT positive now since last December, right? So the business is profitable, right? Point number one. So now in addition to that, we were very glad that as part of our process, as part of our overall business plan, we looked at what money we need and uh, Abdul Latif Jamil Group completed the transaction and it is like you said in two tranches, $150 million, roughly mm, 1170 crores, right? For a 35 plus percent stake, right? That is in tranche one, right? And uh, they are obviously um, uh, the second largest shareholder in Greaves Electric Mobility. So they came into the Greaves Electric Mobility, the yeah. which, is 100, which was at that time 100% subsidiary of GCL, right? Now we have GCL plus uh, uh, ALJ into this, right? So I think that's uh, so now where is it going to be used? We were very clear that obviously they like us bring in low uh, automotive engineering manufacturing distribution experience right and they're more than in 30 odd countries they work with startups like Rivium. they were one of the founding uh, investors right in electric mobility companies right so some of the learnings that they can bring to the table plus the fund utilization will be predominantly for product expansion recently our team i think at the last uh, analyst call has reported that we will be looking at five new products between two wheelers and three wheelers, right? So uh, investment in products and technology, investment in manufacturing capex, and I briefly talked a little bit about how we've already doubled our manufacturing capacity, mm. right? right? Investment in brand building, Ampere as a brand, and building an aspirational brand, right? And investment in uh, people and resources. So we are very clear that that's kind of where the money is going to go into the business and into creating uh, modes for the future. 
you would use up you would use the option to raise the second tranche as well i presume that entails uh, some more further dilution yeah so uh, absolutely i think that option exists uh, to your point earlier it's an additional 70 million dollars that's available uh, right by the partner and uh, we can call upon that should the board decide but right now when i look at my books and when i look at my uh, the current needs i think uh, the 150 million i think uh, will be fine but we have that cushion as well so right now um, we'll will deal with it as a, as and when we cross that bridge so what's the monthly run rate currently now that your production facilities or production quantum has doubled uh, how does that alter the landscape reaching into the festive season and beyond that yeah that's a, a actually a good question because if you but if if it's okay i'll just put some things in perspective please right? do please do yeah so the manufacturing capacity itself like i said went from 10000 roughly per month to almost about 20000 plus per month right so which is we are at roughly at about 250000 units capacity manufacturing capacity one mm -hmm. chip and if needed it can be doubled up point number one when i look at q1 of 23 we sold almost 30000 units 29600 roughly right so that's about 10000 a month yes correct mm versus q1 of 22 so just a year before right it was 2150 units right so the and quarter four was about 24000 units so quarter four was 24000 quarter one was almost 295 right so it's a good uh, uh, quarter on quarter growth almost 20% right yes and mm -hmm. year on growth year growth of course is uh, significant 2000 going to 29000 right but that with our manufacturing capacity being sorted out. Then, as you know, the entire industry was facing with the supply chain crunch. Mm -hmm. I would say the, uh, we've made significant progress, both in terms of uh, all of our suppliers are localized, right? I think we've made significant progress. Obviously, the chips and the cells uh, have been a constraint. It's getting better, and we anticipate that to get better over the next couple of quarters, right? So I think when you look at that, right? So the things within our control, manufacturing capacity, working with our supply chain, all of those bottlenecks we worked out. Now, I think uh, to your point, let's see how what the festival season brings. If the demand increases, I think we are ready. Okay, so. Uh, 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 I would have presumed that some of this would have been preempted considering the kind of uh, surveys that you would have done, that you would expect that the demand would probably shape up. Are there telltale signs to suggest that demand would continue to remain robust? Or would you believe that um, uh, things could be otherwise? Because I presume thus far, while for traditional two-wheelers, uh, rains and rural performance is the key, in, in the EV space, it's the urban demand. And thus far, whoever I talk to, which caters to the urban demand landscape, nobody's complaining. Yeah, no, actually, you're right. I think when you look at it, uh, the total market, right, was running at about uh, last year, by the way, the total uh, two wheel electric market was about 250,000 units, right? Uh, we anticipate uh, about somewhere between the 600 to 700,000 range for this year, right? So it's a significant growth. That is where I, I keep talking about the four to 5%, right? Four to 5% of the market will become electric, right? And to your point, there are two indicators one is what you just talked about the retail consumer both in the rural and in the urban markets coming in then the e-commerce growth or the b2b provider right uh, uh, which is also driving the growth uh, and uh, to your point the tier two tier three cities are also expected to transition so i think when you look at it i think uh, there are multiple factors both b2b and b2c that are driving this uh, potential having said that though i should also caution that uh, the recent macroeconomic situation over the last mm. eight, nine weeks, plus obviously uh, the entire industry uh, evolving, right? Uh, I think has created a little bit of a dampener, but we do expect uh, the demand to continue to increase because we're still coming up a very small base. But is it is it starting to show in, in, the, in the trend of the numbers? Uh, no, the trend of number is still increasing, right? And okay. we anticipate that trend to continue. Uh, the only thing is the scrutiny has gone up. 
people coming ah, into okay. the ship and the conversions, right? The, there are a lot more conversations that are happening before the conversion happens. Got it, got it. Uh, as of May, you were number three, you're still number three, or has those yeah. numbers changed? Yes, we are in that three, in the top three, top four, yes. Uh, top three, top four, okay, great. Now, my, my final set of questions is, so, uh, how from a, from a perspective of a of a shareholder of Greaves Cotton, or potential or current, would be looking at uh, how would the absolute numbers grow like? Because the narrative is obviously very strong. Uh, maybe there are reasons. May, there could be some things which you would want to caution us about as well. But broadly, in line with how strong the narrative is, how well do you think the numbers shape up? Considering that uh, you probably still have some bit of net debt in, in Greaves Electric Mobility, uh, but the other businesses are also firing and you have access to capital now, should you want to act, should you want to get it as well, which you said you might not even need currently. So from a shareholder's perspective, how do the numbers move to your mind over the course of the next two, three, four years? Yeah, uh, so I think Meeranj, uh, 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 typically we do not give forward guidance. However, here is what I will do. Here is what mm -hmm. I will do. Right. Uh, typically, if you look at it past, uh, right, the new business is part of the new business, meaning businesses we have started in the last four years, right, is more than 50 percent, five zero of our revenue. Right. B to C businesses, which was a strategic pivot, is today 64 percent as of the last quarter. Right. So 64 percent is B to C, uh, which was roughly uh, significantly lesser right a couple of quarters ago last quarter q1 of 23 the last reported quarter we did about 660 crores right which was one of our highest quarters right partly because of the to your point uh the three verticals firing right and by the way the automotive engine segment is just coming back three-wheeler uh in business because of shared mobility concerns was one of the worst affected in COVID. it's beginning to come back both we are seeing traction both on the cng and on the diesel side as well so i see positive so while i'm not going to give you a forward looking indicator well i think we had our best quarter 660 crores last quarter and uh, i assume that trend should only continue sure. oh, sorry but i okay uh, but i'll just ask for a clarification you invoked two points about uh the new businesses being 50 percent yes and the b2c being 64 percent yeah now you obviously wanted to make the point about what these numbers could be like, right? So maybe you left that point unfinished. Did I? Did uh, no, work? I think directionally, uh, uh, like I said, for a company that was 70, 80% B2B four years ago, right? Uh, directionally, we wanted to be in this range, 50, 60%. So I think we are getting there, right? And uh, uh, also when I look at uh, now, it's no longer just the one particular thing. So you have the engines business, and even amongst the engine business, you have auto plus non-auto. That's part of the diversification, right? Plus you have the e-mobility. And even under e-mobility, we are probably one of the few players who operates both in two-wheeler and three-wheeler, B2B and B2C. So again, different levels of diversification. Then the retail, which is purely spares and service and uh, uh, retail, right? So when I look at it, I think we are well diversified. And uh, each one of these has the potential, obviously, to different varying extent. I'm sorry, I can't give you a forward guidance, but that's kind of the best I can do. <laughs> no problem. Maybe maybe what will help is that if we, if we talk post your quarterly numbers uh, uh, slightly more regularly, we'll get a sense of how the growth is, and then uh, people can try and make some uh, estimates of themselves, so which I'm sure yeah. people already do on the analyst calls, but we'd love you to have you to talk any which ways. Happy to do that. Happy to. Great. Nagesh, all the best. Thank you so much for spending the time today. Thank you, Neeraj. Have a great day. You too. And viewers, thanks for tuning in.